Wonderful. Christine, I'm going to just invite you to mute yourself briefly before you unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm slowly entering the welcome part of this just because I know people are getting online and jumping from one session to another. Uh, yesterday, I experienced the slight we weirdness that we'll all be experiencing of talking to an audience we can't see. So I just want to say we know you're out there. We are trying to feel the vibes, send us vibes, send vibes to us. Those of you who have been teaching on Zoom or doing other life on Zoom, you're used to this, but audience, we're glad you're here and, and we'll try to feel you. I hope you can feel us. Uh, my name is Rebecca Gould. I'm on the board of the Thoreau Society, uh, talking to you from Vermont. I'm a professor of environmental studies at Middlebury College, trained as a scholar of religion and very excited for this panel. A few little technical details I'm gonna share with everyone. And then I will introduce each panelist uh, before the panelist gives her talk. Uh, so you don't have to keep track of everybody all at once. I'm gonna introduce Christine, invite Christine to speak, then introduce Dr. Beverly Pittman, and then introduce Natasha each before their talk. I know I'm breaking from um, precedent there, but I actually think it, it works better. Um, just so audience people know, there is a, a chat in feed loop. Some of you, probably most of you by now have figured out how to do that. And by some technological ma magic, that chat will go to our q and I'll be keeping track of that Q&A. And in the last 15 minutes of our time together, uh, we'll have some question and answer. And um, I will do my best to moderate that with the caveat that I have double vision. So sometimes it's hard for me to look at you and look at the chat. So so forgive me when I'm not making eye contact to all of those whom I can't quite see. Anyway, welcome. Uh, our first panelist for this afternoon's conversation is Christine O'Connor. She is a writer and an attorney, chief counsel for Lowell Mass. And she's a former board member and counsel to the Throw Society. In terms of some of the writing that she's done, she's written about the poet Seamus Haney, in an anthology, Atlantic Currents, featuring Irish and American writers. And Christine, if there's anything else you wanted to add from your bio, please, and that goes for the rest of you, if there's something I don't put in that you wanna get in there, please uh, take it forward. And unmute yourself and- um, There we go, that was, uh, that was great, thank you. All right, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the, um, I have a, um, uh, my paper topic is on um, uh, Thoreau and the, the Irish question. The, uh, the title of it is, uh, quote, uh, in a lake of rainbow light, end quote, where Thoreau and the Irish meet. And, um, uh, and just by way of background, that, um, uh, that quote comes from uh, the Baker Farm uh, chapter in, um, in Weldon. In the fall of 2017, I went to an exhibit uh, of Henry David Thoreau's journals and personal belongings at the Concord Museum. There was his green desk, worn bare in places, his spyglass and flute, his T-square and compass, his copy of the Bhagavad Gita, the lock from the cell in which he spent a night in jail, and even the pen Brother Henry last wrote with, as his sister Sophia noted on its tag. But his journals were the real attraction. He had given many of them names, like the Big Red Journal, his earliest surviving volume. The Indian books dedicated to his study and admiration of Native Americans, the Canada Notebook, or the Long Book, which traveled with he and his brother John for their time on the Concord and the Merrimack Rivers. There were, of course, his journals from his two years, two months, and two days at Weldon Pond. It was this writing, more than any other, that became his most influential work. It was rewritten and revised over a period of several years. In the end, there were over a thousand manuscript pages and seven major drafts until on August 9th, 1854, he wrote in his journal, Walden Published. The title page had a sketch of his cabin that his sister Sophia drew. But the journal that left the greatest impression on me was the one without a name. It was his last journal. On the top half of the page 
are his final words written after a violent, violent rainstorm. Quote, I can tell within the smallest fraction of a degree from what quarter the rain came. All this is perfectly distinct to an observant eye and yet could easily pass unnoticed by most, end quote. Looking at the hurried handwriting and the blank space that followed, I thought of Henry, sick with tuberculosis, looking out the window on his lap, the same journal that was now under glass, his pen resting in that space between his thumb and forefinger, and of his gaze following the splatter of each drop hitting the ground. In that silence that follows every rainstorm would have come the sound of his feathered steel tip pen scratching those last lines across the page. A few days following the exhibit, I traveled to Ireland to visit family. In Dublin, I happened upon an exhibit of W.B. Yeats at the National Library of Ireland. Similar to the previous exhibit, on display were Yeats' poems, plays, and even some automatic writings. They were his personal belongings, spectacles, a passport, a deck of tarot cards, books from his library, and his medal from the Irish Academy of Letters. In a section dedicated to Yeats' early years was a copy of Walden. In the upper right-hand corner, he signed his name and entered the date, April 2nd, 1886. By that time, Walden had gone through several printings and Sophia's sketch of the cabin was no longer included. The book was a gift from his father and from it, Yeats began to dream of someday living like Thoreau in a cabin on the uninhabited island of Innisfree in County Sligo. It would be years later though, while walking along a busy street in London, that the sound of water trickling from a fountain reminded Yeats of water lapping on the shores of Innisfree and of his earlier Thoreauvian dreams. Within a few days, he began to work on a poem that was to become one of his most popular, The Lake Isle of Innisfree. Quote, I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin build there of clay and waffles made, end quote. Lingering before Yeats opened copy of Walden, I noticed a faint circular impression left by a glass that must have once rested upon it. Somehow this ring stain struck me. It was an ordinary yet intimate detail likely left by Yeats himself. If the Lake Isle of Innisfree made Yeats a literary heir to Thoreau, the ring stain was a reminder that Yeats, like me, was once a reader of Thoreau. Yeats was hardly the only writer in Ireland influenced by Thoreau's writings. Richard Fleck argues in a piece entitled Irish Interest in Thoreau that his writings were introduced to the country in the 1870s and 80s, and that Walden's philosophy of simplify became popular with those in the freedom movement and the war for independence. But thoughts of writers such as George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde, and Yeats being influenced by Thoreau and his writings only served to remind me of the long running question as to Thoreau's relationship with 19th century Irish immigrants. For the sake of scholarship, the question has importance. Could someone who fought so hard for the rights and dignity and freedom of people of color been influenced by the anti-Irish sentiment of the 19th century? As a second generation Irish American who like so many others has been enriched and inspired by Thoreau, the question had a more personal meaning. I had been left disappointed before. In graduate school, while researching the ideological connections between Jonathan Edwards and Emerson, came the discovery that Emerson's lecture tour in the Midwest was where he exposed the virtues of the English race at a time when the country was experiencing record numbers of Irish immigrants. Newspaper accounts noted that never had Emerson made more sense. It was also after my many years of working at the Orchard House, the discovery of Louisa May Alcott's article on Irish domestic servants. No Irish need apply was her answer to the foreign incapables. But what of Thoreau? The question grows largely from the Baker Farm chapter of Walden and his unflattering description of the Field family. It all starts with an unexpected rainstorm, or as he describes it, a shower. After spending a half hour under pine tree, under pine tree with heavy clouds, thunder, and lightning closing in, he makes for the nearest shelter, the fields. After his time with the family, Thoreau makes his regrettable pronouncement that, quote, alas, the culture of an Irishman 
is an enterprise to be taken with a sort of moral boggo, end quote. The reality, however, as most notably laid out in an essay by Laura Walls, quote, as you are brothers of mine, end quote, uh, or Thoreau in the Irish, there is much to suggest that it would be a mistake to define Thoreau by this single chapter. There is Thoreau dressed in corduroy pants, popular among the Irish of his day. His defense of Michael Flannery, who was cheated out of his prize money, his closeness with the Reardon family. In short, as Thoreau's most recent and arguably definite, most definitive biographer, Walls concludes, quote, there is no question that Thoreau identified with the Irish far more deeply than has yet been acknowledged. Perhaps adding to this list of connections between Thoreau and the Irish is a shared language of the natural world. If Thoreau could tell within the smallest degree from what quarter the rain came, so too could the Irish, who have over 50 words and phrases to describe the rain, and that's just in English. In Ireland, there are no shortage for words of days of meteorological outbursts. It's a country that recognizes the difference between a soft day and a rotten day, between a mist and a drizzle, a mizzle, if you're wondering. After all, the Irish distinguish between such things, not just because they can, but because they understand the difference. Consider this, the Irish word bulwitug, which means a shaft or ray of light on the wrong side of the sun, a sign of bad weather approaching. Such specificity of language to reflect and understand the natural world runs deep in the Irish language. There are words to describe the sound of large waves pulling pebbles from the shore and then rolling them back in, suetu, or a small rain, rainbow sticking up off the sea to the northwest in the morning, moagia. Whether or not Thoreau was fond of 19th century Irish immigrants may remain unresolved for some, but between Thoreau and the Irish is a clearly shared language and reverence for the natural world around them. In, Thoreau, in Thoreau's corresponding journal entry for the Baker Farm chapter, August 23rd, 19, 1845, he writes about the universality, universality of language. Quote, in all the dissertations of language, men forget the language that is, is really universal, the inexpressible meaning that is in all things and everywhere, with which the morning and evening team, as if language were especially of the tongue, of course, with a more copious learning and understanding of what is published, the present language and all they express will be forgotten. The rays which stream through the crevices will no more be remembered when, sh when the shadow is wholly removed. There is a power in language. It not only describes our connections with nature, but the connections between ourselves. And here, in that quote, inexpressible meaning that is in all things, quote, is a shared passion and connection between Thoreau and the Irish. By the time I left the National Library that day, the sky was gray and heavy. Looks like rain, I said to one of the library staff at the door. Not rain, but maybe a shower, she replied. Sure enough, as I got back in the car, the day turned wet and I traveled west along a rain-soaked stretch of the M4. As the RTE news played in the car, my thoughts drifted back to Henry, sitting in his chair, listening to a rainstorm, to Yates, listening to the movement of water from a city fountain and hearing Henry's inspiring call to nature and to the old Reardon woman who sat in the rain so close to nature. By the time I reached Galway, the showers let up. Light, for the first time that day, streaked from behind the clouds. There's a phrase in Irish for such moments, Fonyagalia, which means the first bright ring of daylight. And then, and there again, is a shared language of nature, of being an observant eye, in the opening of Baker Farm, of the Baker Farm chapter, Thoreau too describes a certain light. Quote, once it chanced that I stood in the very abutment of a rainbow's arch, which filled the lower stratum of the atmosphere, 
tinging the grass and leaves around and dazzling me as if I looked through a colored crystal. It was a lake of rainbow light in which for a short while I lived like a dolphin, end quote. The arch of nature's light is broad. It is colorful and colorless. And it is yet another place in the natural world where Thoreau and the Irish meet. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was so evocative. I have to bite my tongue not to ask some questions right away. Uh, I just want to say in that connection that I was a misnomer. I referred to the, the question asking um, as a chat function in the feed loop. And what I should have said is the Q&A function in the feed loop. I trust, again, audience folks, many of you have figured that out. But um, my tech god, William, wanted me to make, make it clear. So the Q&A function is what you're looking for. Uh, Thank you so much, Christine. I'm gonna move on to our next presenter who's Dr. Beverly Pittman, a teacher of health and well wellness. She's taught health and wellness in African-American uh, in academic settings and is now especially focused on doing the same in African-American settings, focusing on health promotion and health um, prevention in uh, illness prevention in African-American communities. She's working on a book that is also about her work uh, I don't know if it has a working title yet, uh, but if it does, you can tell us what it is. But what I have here is having to do with health behaviors that are inherent in African and African-American cultures. Throughout her work, um, Dr. Pittman is committed to doing research and practice that's based on Afrocentric principles. And I imagine some of that is gonna come through in her talk. So welcome. Beverly, and again, please chime in with anything I've left out that you would like to add for our audience to know. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, just to start, uh, the name of the book that I'm working on is called We Shall Be Moved. And uh, I've also started a nonprofit organization with the same name. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Beverly Pittman and I am presenting from the unceded land of the Lenny Lenape, which is now known as Philadelphia. I'm going to share my screen with you today because I've got a slide presentation that's going to. There we go. Let's see. Perhaps what happened here? I need to go back. There we go. Okay. The title of my topic is A Different Drummer, Afrocentric female and introverted in a Eurocentric male extroverted society. I'm going to start with some definitions. Afrocentrism is the viewing of life and society from an African American perspective. In its purest form, it is consistent with the view of human beings as a holistic part of something larger than ourselves. In the United States, it is often perceived negatively, and I believe racism is the root of that perception. Eurocentrism, on the other hand, is a viewing of life and society from a European or European-American perspective. It is often capitalistic and man-focused. Uh, in the US, it is often perceived as, quote unquote, just normal. It is also increasingly perceived as racist because it tries to erase other cultures and perspectives. This has been a major cause underlying my journey. Before moving forward, let me share one of my favorite Henry quotes. I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. I absolutely agree. Therefore, this presentation is mostly about me and my journey to be who I am. When I was a little girl, my siblings and I had assigned chores that supposedly corresponded to our abilities. My sister was older, so she was responsible for washing the dishes. I was younger and responsible for drying the dishes. But drying dishes didn't make sense to me because if you left them where they were long enough, they would eventually dry themselves. When I said this to my mother, she said I had to dry them anyway because she said so. From that, I learned to not question her anymore and just discreetly did other things and then put the dishes away when they were dry. I didn't know it at the time, but I was engaging in critical thinking around issues of time management and science. 
My critical thinking skills have always been with me and have often come into play in my life, which has always been Afrocentric. I have divided this presentation into four Afrocentric phases in my life. Phase one occurred during my early childhood when I spent my summers in the Jim Crow South with relatives either on my grandparents' farm or in the small city nearby. I was aware of the rigid rules of Jim Crow segregation, but I was not directly affected by them because my relatives lived in a Tulsa-like environment. If you are not familiar with what I mean by that, the movie Hidden Figures provides an example. My relatives and their neighbors were homeowners, landowners, business people, teachers, and medical professionals. There were no sharecroppers or domestics in my family, but we knew them in the community. They were not treated any differently because they were valued for who they were as human beings, not for what they did to earn a living. I don't want to make, give the impression that everything was idyllic. My relatives still lived under Jim Crow laws, one of, my business, one of the businesses my family owned was a taxi service that catered to the African-American community. Unfortunately, my uncle who originally owned that business was lynched long before I was born and his murder is included in the list of unsolved civil rights murders. The taxi service was taken over by my uncle Leon and continued to exist well beyond my childhood. This had a lasting impact on me. My summer experiences were but part of my childhood. For the most part, as a first generation Northerner, my time was spent in the integrated North in Philadelphia. My parents believed in integration, and when I was three years old, we moved to a predominantly white neighborhood. By the time I started school, white flight had taken over and the schools were predominantly black. However, when I was eight years old, I was labeled gifted and sent to a school outside of my neighborhood. This should have been the first clue to my introversion because giftedness and introversion are highly correlated. I did not feel gifted, however, and I did not see myself there because my experiences were not reflected in the curriculum. So I searched for myself in other places. Reading was one of my greatest pleasures and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the story of a little girl who was searching for her identity and not afraid to question things around her resonated with me. I could see myself and that book continues to be part of my journey now as I am, member of the, I am a member of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America. In addition, in the mid 1960s, Star Trek became a phenomenon and another fictional character, a black woman also became a major influence in my life. By the end of my years in an integrated gifted school, I knew I needed to be in a place where there were other people like me. So despite my parents' wishes, I entered Afrocentrism phase two and attended my neighborhood school, which was 99% Black. There, we had a combined curriculum of mainstream education and Black-centered education. For example, in my English classes, I read Richard Wright's Black Boy, my first book about African-American life. It heavily dealt with the Jim Crow South and, great, and the Great Migration, so it resonated with me. My American history class, however, had only a Eurocentric perspective, and I hated it so much that it is the only class on my transcript for which I received a D grade, far lower than all the other grades. By this time in my life, I was so frustrated with school that after graduation, I took a six-year break before starting college. My parents were not happy about that. When I finally decided to attend college in 1976, I entered Afrocentrism phase three and chose to attend an HBCU. Again, there was a combined curriculum in my, English to, in my English course and our focus on satire included both Jonathan Swift and Douglas Turner Ward. In my sociology major, we studied the classic sociologists as well as well-known black scholars studying black life. I graduated valedictorian of my class and I credit the combined perspective with re-energizing my love for education. Although I was fortunate enough in my early years to have positive black experiences, especially positive black role, female role models, there was something that made me different, even from the other people in my family. I did not understand it. And for a long time, I tried to force myself to be like everyone else. Then I came across a quote about a different drummer. I saw myself and it changed my life. 
I did not know Thoreau's work at the time, and because of the combined curriculum my in my educational experiences, apparently his writings did not make the cut. But my own propensity for reading led me to him, and he has been a constant companion since then. I see myself in him. His need for solitude, his deep thinking, and his ability to see beyond what white society presents as the norm all resonated with me. He saw humans as part of something universal, something larger, pretty much the way Afrocentric culture sees it. As, so back to my phases, let's fast forward to Afrocentrism phase four, which brings us closer to the present. After trying for many years to work in Eurocentric environments, in 1997, I returned to school to pursue my PhD. I attended a mainstream school with a strong African-American studies program and created my own combined curriculum to address health disparities among African-Americans. Critical race theory was a part of my studies in the African-American studies program, and there was no big to do about it because critical race theory is basically a specialized form of critical thinking, which encourages people to think beyond what appears to be the truth. It is necessary in a society that is built on half-truths and many omissions. It allowed me to see in a curriculum all the things I had seen earlier in my life and things that would guide my future efforts. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Kendi, and I followed similar academic paths and probably had similar experiences in the work world, but we have taken separate paths. He has chosen to educate white people and other non-Black POC, whereas I have chosen to focus my work on the African-American community. I have tried to combine my focus with more mainstream environments, but it has not worked for me. In most situations, starting with my doctoral program, there has been an explicit focus on what I can do for white people, whether that means making white as institutions eligible for research funding that they otherwise would not get, or filling an affirmative action quota as a twofer, African-American and female. Outside of academia, there has often been an expectation that I am there to serve the needs of white people, primarily by recruiting other African-Americans. Two thoughts come to mind about that. First, I never learned to be a servant to white people because that was not a part of my experience. And second, and probably more important, I am an introvert, so I am not good as a recruiter to anyone. And because I do not cater to the whims of white people, I often get called uppity. However, Dr. Kendi cannot fight this battle alone, so I am willing to share some resources for people who might want to do some self-study beyond what he can provide in a one-hour talk and I can provide in a 15-minute session. Therefore, I have asked to make this presentation available to anyone who wants it, and the next few slides, as well as some you have already seen, can serve as a possible starting place. Here are resources for African Americans' views on racism and white liberalism. Here are resources for African-American views on what's lacking in mainstream education and where you can learn more. Here's a perspective on the new Juneteenth federal holiday. Here are examples of the Afrocentric worldview. So to bring it back to me and my story, let me return to Star Trek, which I consider a prototype for a society very different from the one in which we have lived for so long. In 1966, at the height of the civil rights movement and integration, I saw part of myself in Lieutenant Uhura, a black female, on my television screen. Beyond her gender and race, there wasn't much that I knew about her, but I was so affected by her presence that when I later became a mother, I named my first child after the actress who portrayed her. 21 years after 1966, in 1987, I saw part of myself in Ensign Wesley Crusher, a gifted child who was often disregarded by the adults around him, even though time and again, he was proven right. Finally, 30 years after 1987, in 2017, I saw my whole self in Commander Michael Burnham, the star of the show. She is black, she is female, she is introverted, she is gifted, she, is, she was partially educated in an environment that was not her own. She graduated at the top of her class. And most importantly, she reads Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. 
It took more than 50 years to see myself, but Star Trek finally did it and made a series about me. They put her in an environment that includes many people who are superficially different from her, but they are all working toward a common goal. I believe our society can do the same. As I said earlier, I named my firstborn child after Michelle Nichols. In 2013, I met her at a Star Trek convention and asked her to pose with my daughter's photo and to autograph a copy of the photo. When I returned home, I gave them to my daughter and she was speechless. In conclusion, let me return to my original story about myself. There is now technology that is trademarked as auto air drying technology that automatically opens the door of a dishwasher to quote, let fresh air circulate for 40% drier dishes. It utilizes the natural power of condensation to effectively dry dishes. And you can use it while you are sleeping, which says to me that you can dry dishes and do something else at the same time. I don't have a dishwasher in my current home because I don't feel the need for one. But when I did have one, I simply turned off the machine after the wash cycle, so my early experience never left me. Neither has my early experience as an Afrocentric female introvert. Now it is up to society to catch up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly, for that talk. And I want to remind, I see one that has just come in, but I think between the two talks that we've already heard, and I know Natasha's will bring us further, um, there's a lot to talk about. So please, again, uh, send your questions in through the Q&A function of Feedloop. And, and thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I can't wait to talk more. So our third presenter is Natasha Shabbat. And I actually met Natasha before I even knew who she was because I was at Walden Pond um, taking a dip and visiting from out of state because I have long standing connections to Concord. And I saw and heard this woman teaching somebody Hebrew at Walden, teaching Hebrew to someone at Walden. And I was like, two things I love Walden Pond and Hebrew but never have I seen them together. Um, and then two years later, I met Natasha and it all came full circle. So Natasha is an independent scholar, photographer and writer. She has a BA in um, Near Eastern Languages and Literature from Harvard. She's been teaching Hebrew in various ways, including at Walden Pond for 23 years. I don't know if you're still doing Walden people, uh, Natasha, but I've occasionally seen that uh, before I kind of gave up Facebook. And uh, a very creative person, as I've been getting to know her, I've been getting to hear more and more how she connects um, different parts of her life in ways that I find quite fascinating. So Natasha, um, I'm going to turn it over to you with whatever title you want to give to your presentation today. Thanks, Becky. That was great. <clears throat> Um, so my presentation title uh, comes partly from Walden in the economy chapter. It is never too late to give up our prejudices. The rest of my title is Thoreau's Ecclesiastical Walden and the anti-Semitism of his milieu. I do like to mix my different interests, it's true. Um, and it's actually really easy for me to see Hebrew in Walden. Uh, which I hope to <clears throat> wrap up with about the connection between Walden and the biblical book of Ecclesiastes. Um, but first, I wish to speak a word for Hebrew, for the Hebrew language, uh, the original language of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, what it's called the Old Testament. And I want to say that um, thanks to the pandemic, online education, community education has really expanded and so I have the pleasure of teaching beginners this summer through towns that are mentioned in Thoreau's writings, um, places we call Thoreau country. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, I'm teaching Hebrew through the Concord Carlisle Community Education and Acton Boxborough Community Education. And it's a great way to bring teachers to Concord as Thoreau wished for uh, beyond the Lyceum. And I should mention that only about half of these students that I'm teaching right now in this class are Jewish. Um, so there's lots of 
reasons to learn Hebrew, to be able to read the Bible in the original. Um, and just for one little example of a mistranslation that we have thanks to English, uh, specifically the King James uh, translation, which is the one that Thoreau was familiar with. Um, you might be familiar with the line, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Well, that word vanity is not a good translation of the Hebrew, which is hevel, which is really a concrete noun, uh, something ephemeral and impermanent, but still concrete. A better translation would be mist or vapor or fog or even merest breath. Think of it this way. <clears throat> breath, merest breath, all is mere breath. Now, Hebrew uh, is rightly considered one of the classical languages, one of the three in the West, the three classical languages uh, that we include Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And all three of these were taught at Harvard from its beginning. And I love to quote Thoreau when I get to this point because in his chapter on reading in Walden, he says the adventurous student, and I like to think we're all adventurous students, uh, will always study classics in whatever language they may be written and however ancient they may be. And he also says in the same chapter, those who have not learned to read the ancient classics in the language in which they were written must have a very imperfect knowledge of the history of the human race. Um, so from there, I wanna talk very briefly about uh, something called Christian Hebraism. This is basically the enthusiasm and study and interest in Hebrew, biblical Hebrew of the Bible by Christians. So um, in Massachusetts, in Puritan New England and at Harvard, Hebrew played a very important role. The Puritans saw themselves like the ancient Israelites driven from their homes into the wilderness to rebuild the promised land. So this new continent, North America, um, with this promised land. And um, you might be familiar with uh, one of the uh, presidents of Harvard um, from way back, Increase Mather. Uh, just is a great example of a Christian Hebraic name. Um, it seems like a strange name, Increase, uh, but that's basically a translation from the name Joseph. So he could have been named Joseph Mather. Um, the Hebrew verb to increase is lehosif, and that's where we get the name Joseph. Uh, so he could have been Joseph Mather, but he was Increase Mather. That's just an example. Um, so Christian Hebraism is really different from Jewish Hebraism. In fact, that latter term hardly even makes any sense. Um, Hebrew, the language is such an integral part of Judaism and the practice of that religion in Jewish life that uh, you could say that being Jewish means being Hebraist, um, notwithstanding all the American Jews who don't know Hebrew, but they will, they will. Um, so, uh, needless to say, at the beginning of Harvard, um, there were no Jews there. There were no Jewish students. There were certainly no Jewish uh, professors or instructors. There were no Jews in Concord or Cambridge. And even in Massachusetts and Boston, there were uh, at first none. And by the time, uh, by the 19th century, by Thoreau's period, there were still only a couple hundred Jews in Boston. Um, but getting back to Harvard and its um, beginning, the first in, in the United States, the first instructor of Hebrew was a man named Judah Monis. He lived from 1683 to 1764. He was North America's first college instructor. He was at Harvard um, from 1722 to 1760, almost 40 years. And he wrote the first Hebrew textbook published in America. Um, and in fact, he was actually responsible for the first Hebrew typesetting equipment in North America. Um, he actually got Harvard to import some from Europe and be able to print in Hebrew so that his textbook that he wrote the first Hebrew textbook so that that could be printed in uh, locally in Boston. 
but before he could teach at Harvard, he had to convert to Christianity. Um, he had a public baptism in Harvard College Yard, and he wrote three treatises to accompany his baptism. He read one of them uh, at the, his baptism, and he called them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And uh, they were basically his um, argument for why Christianity, Protestant Christianity was better than Judaism. Um, and that allowed him to teach at Harvard. Um, people were not necessarily entirely convinced of the sincerity of his conversion, whether he had really become a Christian at heart. And for most of his career, people called him Judah the Jew or the rabbi. Um, and although he married a Protestant Christian woman in Cambridge and lived there uh, for the rest of his life, um, it said that he still on Saturdays observed the Jewish Sabbath uh, Shabbat, according to Jewish practice. We don't know that for sure. So now I want to show you a slide. Um, just a second. We're only going to have a few slides here. Okay. There we go. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna be able to read my notes at the same time. Um, okay, so this is the cover of the book that Judah Monis wrote for Harvard. Um, you can see it's a it's in Hebrew at the top, also transliterated in a strange way, Dikduk Lashon Ivrit, a grammar of the Hebrew tongue being an essay to bring the Hebrew grammar into English. Um, <laughs> this isn't the best English on this cover. Anyway, for the instruction in the primitive tongue. So this was his first book of Hebrew instruction in North America. Um, <clears throat> and I want to move from there to the topic of anti-Semitism in um, uh, really brief history and then get to what it was like when in Thoreau's period. Um, so first I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I'll just leave it. Okay, so we could call the first period anti-Judaism and this is going back to early Christianity. Anti-Judaism was against the religion itself and its practitioners. Um, Anti-Judaism was uh, against uh, why <clears throat> practitioners of Judaism refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah. They were called Christ killers. Uh, they um, were criticized for keeping the commandments as given in the Hebrew Bible and for refusing to convert to Christianity. That was the first period. We could call the second period anti-Semitism rather than anti-Judaism um, over many, many centuries um, up to our present day included. And this was mainly in Europe. Um, it started in the Middle Ages with um, the blood libel. I assume people know that term. Um, there as into the um, more modern period among <clears throat> mostly among Christians in Europe. And in the more modern period, um, it's, it gradually evolved from a criticism of the religion to more of a racist point of view. And uh, the Jewish race was considered inferior. Um, and of course, people, other people who have been considered other in our culture can also identify with that science of race that happened in the 19th century, mainly maybe starting with the enlightenment um, against people of color and indigenous people, Jews and anyone who is considered other. Um, and we could say that modern anti-Semitism um, 
maybe starting post 1948 with the establishment of the State of Israel um, and anti-Semitism leading into anti-Zionism or we could even say anti-Zionism leading into modern anti-Semitism. So in Thoreau's time, um, Jews were seen very much as the other. Um, in Boston and Massachusetts, there were very few Jews. Uh, <clears throat> the anti-Semites in Massachusetts had never met a Jew for the most part. Most people in Massachusetts had never met a Jew. They only had an idea of a Jew. Um, as Michael Hoberman put it, Jews were a figment of the Protestant imagination at that time and place. So the anti-Semitism that existed was basically imported from Europe. Um, children learned it in their public school textbooks um, that they should hate Jews as Christ killers and particularists. They learned this in their rel religious instruction. Um, unfortunately, even among the abolitionists, there was anti-Semitism of the imported European Christian type. Um, but at the same time, um, converting the Jews, and I'm talking still 19th century Thoreau's period, converting the Jews was seen as a really important goal uh, for a good Protestant Christian. In fact, throughout the whole 19th century, and especially from the 1830s through the 1860s, um, many Christians joined missionary societies aimed at, quote, enlightening Jews and others, and there were groups like the Female Society of Boston and Vicinity for Promoting Christianity and the American Society for Evangelizing the Jews, which in 1820 became the American Society for Meliorating the Conditions of the Jews. These groups worked tirelessly to achieve their goal. Um, from 1823 to 1826, that latter organization published a periodical called Israel's Advocate, exhorting Christians to make every effort to convert Jews. Um, in Massachusetts, that was not so easy because there were so few Jews to be converted. Um, okay, so. Here we have a quotation from a letter that Theodore Parker, who was an instructor of Hebrew at Harvard um, and an abolitionist, and I'm going to assume people are familiar with him, um, but he did write in this letter in 1857, religious emotion, religious will, I think, never went farther than with the Jews, but their intellect was sadly pinched in those narrow foreheads. They were cruel also, always cruel. I doubt not that they did sometimes kill a Christian baby at the Passover. So this is an example of um, all the various types of anti-Semitism from the uh, shape of a Jew's head to the blood libel, even in the 19th century and ideas about Jews in general that were negative. Um, I have another quotation. So these are people in Thoreau's circle. Um, this is from Horace Greeley, um, the newspaper editor. Um, who had a correspondence with Thoreau um, and helped Thoreau publish many of his essays. Um, in this letter, Horace Greeley wrote, if you are satisfied to take the $25 for your main woods, say so and I will send on the money, but I don't want to seem a Jew buying your articles at half price to speculate upon. If you choose to let it go that way, it shall be so, but I would sooner do my best for you and send you the money. And uh, Thoreau wrote back and he just didn't mention anything about seeming a Jew or anything about um, any of those stereotypes about Jews. He just seemed to skip that part of Greeley's letter. And uh, you can see it in their correspondence back and forth. Horace Greeley says things like this over and over and Thoreau does not respond to them. He doesn't mention them, he doesn't repeat them. So that's an example of um, my, uh, vision of Thoreau, my impression in all the reading I've done so far, is that although he was really surrounded by this anti-Semitism, he didn't seem to express it much. Um, here's another example. Um, his friend Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, mentioned uh, negative stereotypes of Jews in his novel. And 
Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, unfortunately, wrote this in his journal about being offended by Polish Jews. This was in an art exhibit. Um, and um, in the interest of time, I want to jump forward to something from Thoreau's Indian notebooks. So this is from 1855. Um, he read this Adair's History of the American Indian, which was published um, 70 years earlier. And uh, this is Thoreau's text um, that he feels that he may have come upon the true Hebrew pronunciation of the divine essential name. Um, and in the red circle there, that's Thoreau's handwriting, um, taking a stab at writing in Hebrew script. Um, and that uh, um, Adair had put forward the theory that the uh, religion of the American Indians um, evolved from Judaism and that the Indian languages evolved from Hebrew. Um, th these ideas have mostly been um, discounted, but this is what was going on at the time. And underneath the quote, I just wanted to show you what those four letters look like in Hebrew print. That's the right hand block and in Hebrew handwriting or script in the left-hand block, just so you can kind of see what Thoreau's writing looked like. Um, Asha, I'm gonna to have to jump so, over, over time at this point. Yep. So, uh, so Thoreau, it was connected to the Hebrew Bible in more ways than we might realize. Sorry, technical glitch. Uh, I've been on all sides of this, so sorry to cut you off, I've, but we need to have a little time for Q&A. There's been some technical conversation, uh, but I think I've managed to capture some of the questions. And then if there is time and any of you panelists have a question to pose to the other uh, panelists or one other panelist, please do, because I think that's also very interesting. Uh, we have one for Beverly from Patrick Lee who wanted to hear more about the mission of your nonprofit. Sure, that's one of my passions right now. Uh, as I said, the book is called We Shall Be Moved and the organization has the same title. The name comes from the civil rights protest song, We Shall Not Be Moved. But because my work focuses on the role of physical activity in health promotion and chronic disease prevention, we Shall Be Moved is the name that I chose for it. Um, one of the things, this came out of my experiences working in corporate health. And in 1996, the Surgeon General came out with a report on physical activity and health and identified African-Americans and women as special needs populations. So of course, African-American women fit into both of those groups. When I looked at the report and when I looked at the types of physical activities they reported, there was nothing that was culturally based included in that. And even though there are stereotypes about it, the primary form of physical activity in African American communities is dance. And a lot of those dances originated on the continent, came across the Middle Passage with enslaved Africans and continue to exist now. So my work looks at those movement patterns that many African-Americans know, whether they know where they came from or not, they participate, they just have not connected them with health. So that's what I do with it, connect what's something natural in the culture with something that is health promoting. That's great, thank you, Beverly. Sure. Um, I have, and Patrick just thanked you also. Uh, I have a question coming from Jane Gordon over to Christine. Christine, you mentioned the similarities. Sorry, I'm trying to move this over here. Oh, there we go. You mentioned the similarities in the ways Thoreau and the Irish wrote about different types of weather. What about how they wrote about geographical features? Did you see anything there? Uh, well, a great, a great question. And, um, um, the, this doesn't really quite answer it, but um, what I became really interested in as I was um, sort of working on this is uh, sort of in the tradition of um, uh, Robert McFarland, uh, kind of lost words. And uh, there's um, 
uh, an Irish writer, again, who also is looking at a lot of uh, lost language um, of Irish words, the um, um, most of those words connect to the natural world. And, um, and because we, as we move further and further from the natural world, um, we are um, not just losing touch with nature, but we're losing touch with the language, which is sort of what struck me uh, so interesting about that, that quote in Thoreau's uh, journal. And um, um, sort of like uh, Natasha taking advantage, I guess, of uh, Zoom uh, this year during the uh, pandemic, I uh, started taking Irish language classes. And um, um, my, my mother's family actually are Russian Jews. So that's next on the list. Uh, but, um, um, but yeah, the, um, well, I can't think of anything in particular in terms of Irish language words as they relate to um, geographical features. Um, there are, you know, there are no doubt tons, um, you know, in terms of, actually there's a new book out, uh, 32 words for field, and that's, in, in Irish, um, and so um, uh, so it's all there. Uh, and uh, and again, just briefly, that's sort of what struck me as um, kind of a um, um, an untapped area, perhaps, of research between Thoreau's language in the journals and um, and having spent so much time writing about nature and how it might mesh with these other other languages. Thank you for that, Christine. Um, I just want to give the panelists a moment. We do have to wrap up pretty, pretty quickly. And as much as I want to linger, I actually have to um, get to, want to, but also have to moderate a, a panel right after this one. So I am going to have to close us pretty close to two. But I would really love to hear if any of you have a question or comment for any of the rest of you. Um, you might have heard connections, distinctions, things in each other's presentation um, that you just want to say something about. So I just wanted to open up that opportunity. I do, I'll, I'll start. Um, let me say that when we first received information about the panels and who we were going to be presenting with, I was very excited to be presenting with these two ladies um, because I thought there was a continuum in what we were talking about. And Christine, I was particularly interested in your presentation because one of the things I look at when people are talking about cross-cultural interaction and cross-cultural communication, I see what's called the culture wars among white people. And if you cannot communicate across beliefs within your own ethnic or racial group, how on earth do you think you're going to communicate across it to someone else? So I was particularly interested in hearing what you were gonna say about Thoreau and the Irish. I, it just all made a lot of sense to me. So thank you and thank you both for that. I'm glad to be here. Anyone else a reaction or comment on the other side? So thanks, thanks for those comments, and and I could not agree could not agree more uh, in terms of the importance of communication and the ability to communicate and to be understood. Um, if, actually, one um, thing that I thought was uh, that I'd just like to quickly note with respect to Natasha's presentation is when um, when Natasha you mentioned that you um, um, Thoreau just really just didn't engage in. Um, this anti-Semitic language um, that was uh, coming at him. Um, I noticed something very similar when the Irish started moving into Concord. Um, it took him quite a while to respond to these letters from back home and from Emerson and others um, suggesting that they were kind of being overrun. And finally, he does respond. And when he does, he sort of makes fun of, I think, the notion that they're being overrun. Uh, by the Irish and, you know, to his, to his sister swept out, hope you're not getting swept out in the Irish Sea. So um, it, it didn't seem as if he was engaging in that language and it was sort of good to hear. Um, that was your kind of take on it as well, what you were finding. I was excited to be on this panel with you two ladies, actually. Um, and again, just going back to my original quote from Walden about how it's never too late to give up our prejudices. 
um, seeing the prejudices of Thoreau's time and the people that were around him and knowing, you know, everything we know about American history and immigration and, uh, you know, people making up this country um, now, I like to think about um, or imagine the future, like two, let's say 200 years in the future, will people look back at us and say, oh, those Thoreau scholars, they thought they were so liberal and open-minded and not racist, but how could they possibly have said, I don't know. So um, I really like to see Thoreau as kind of an example of his era of what we can do in our own times um, to uh, really open our eyes even more. I'd like to make one more comment before we go. Um, I put in my presentation the word uppity because that gets thrown around a lot. And it's interesting because two days ago, we had a perfect example of that with Nicole Hannah-Jones and the whole situation with UNC and everything that they took her through around tenure in hiring her. And they went through this whole process, you know, should we do this? And then finally, just so patronizingly said, okay, we'll give her tenure and we'll let her come here. And she turned around and said, no, thank you. I'm going to an HBCU. That's uppity. That is uppity, you know, and, and that's one of the best examples. The internet has been exploding. African-Americans have been exploding for the past two days about that. And she's getting all kinds of kudos for it. Apologies, my unmute factor seems to be slow. Anyway, I thank you so much for this rich conversation. I will probably be following up with all of you with the questions that I have. Um, this has been a, a wonderful time together. I enjoyed meeting you both, Christine and Beverly for the first time, I think, and Natasha seeing you again. So thank you for this rich panel. I'm gonna run and get a coffee and uh, maybe see you at the next panel. So thank you so much for your fine presentations. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.